Hello and welcome everyone to another exciting event our Sakab Sabanjo Center for Turkish Studies is organizing. Uh, my name is Tun Shen. Um, I'm an assistant professor in the Department of History and also the deputy director of the Sakab Sabanjo Center for Turkish Studies here at Columbia University. Um, it is our great pleasure to host three wonderful guests today. Um, Zeynep Dadak, uh, the director and writer of Ah Gözel Istanbul, Invisible to the Eye, that we'll be discussing today. Uh, Professor Jamal Kafadar um, and Fatih Özgüven. Um, today's panel is the sixth and final meeting of our year-long Turkey Through Its Cinema series of conversations. Uh, it's been a tremendous experience to host the creators of the movies we love, um, together with eminent and film critics and culture critics. Um, if you've missed the previous meetings and discussions, you can always watch the videos uploaded on our YouTube channel. Um, I will give the floor in, in, in, in a minute to my dear colleague uh, and Sakib Sabanji, visiting professor of Turkish studies, uh, Zeynep Çelik, to introduce our guests. But let me express uh, our gratitude, as usual, um, to Sakib Sabanji family uh, for their invaluable support to promote Ottoman and Turkish studies here in New York and beyond. Uh, I should also thank Columbia Global Centers Istanbul uh, for co-sponsoring today's event and uh, the year-long film series. And many thanks to uh, Ararat Shekaryan, uh, our center's program manager, and Sedan Gürlek from Columbia Global Centers Istanbul for their technical support. Um, so without further ado, I'm now turning to Professor Zeynep Çelik to introduce our uh, guests today. Thank you, Tunç. Welcome to our third and last film conversation in our Turkey Through Its Cinema series this semester. Our film today is a unique documentary of sorts released in 2020. Titled Ah Gözel İstanbul, Invisible to the Eye, and based on Eremya Çelebi Kömürciyan's cherished account of Istanbul, it offers a layered picture of the city subtly interlacing its 17th century history with later realities. Zeynep Dadak, the director, holds a PhD from the Cinema Studies Department at NYU's uh, Tisch School of the Arts. Her debut feature film, Mavi Dalga, The Blue Wave, 2013, had its international premiere at 64th Berlin Film Festival, receiving many awards in and outside Turkey. Ah Güzel İstanbul was screened at prestigious film festivals such as Rotterdam, Sheffield, Dokufest, San Francisco, and Juanju. Dadak was selected for the Median Board Artist in Residence in Berlin in 2018 and Berlin Senate's Wealth Offenness Program in 2019. She directed a miniseries called Therapist in 2021. She teaches film classes and workshops uh, worldwide, and currently she is based in Berlin and Istanbul. Dadak is currently working on a new film, Electric Sleep. We can't wait to see it. Cemal Kafadar is Vehbi Koç Professor of Turkish Studies at Harvard University. He works on the social and cultural history of the Middle East and Southeastern Europe in late medieval, early modern uh, era. His publications include Between Two Worlds, The Construction of the Ottoman State, 1995, translated into Greek and Turkish, Turkish the latter by our very own Tunçak. Uh, he is also the author of Kendine Ait Bir Roma, Diyar Rumda Kültürel Coğrafya ve Kimlik Üzerine. Uh, if I may translate it, it would be a Rome of his own, Cultural Geography and Identity in the Land of Rome, 2017. Recently, he co-edited Treasures of Knowledge, an inventory of the Ottoman Palace Library, 1502-1503, and this uh, co-edited volume came out in 2019. 
In addition, he co-authored numerous essays on topics as diverse as coffee consumption in early modern Istanbul and Evliya Çelebi's encounters with the arts of the Franks. Professor Kafada ha, kaf Excuse me, Professor Kafadar has a long term involvement in cinema. He curated a program, Rebel Saints and Troubadours, for the Istanbul International Film Festival in 2009 and worked closely on the conception and production of two historical documentaries, Inspirations 2005 on Sheikh Bedrettin, an, an Ottoman intellectual executed for his ideas and Invisible to the Eye, the subject of our discussion today. Fatih Özgüven is a graduate of Istanbul University, Faculty of Literature, Department of English Language and Literature. He worked as editor and advisor in various publishing houses and translated many literary works into Turkish, among them those by Kundera, Man, Nabokov, Bernhard, and Wolf. Since 1982, Mr. Özgüven has written columns and film criticism in many newspapers. He lectures on cinema and contributes to several film magazines in Turkey. His film criticism has also been published in France, United Kingdom, and the USA. Currently, he's a lecturer in Bilgi University at the Department of Film and Television. Since the 2000s, he published four collections of short stories. Their titles are Something Happens, I Never Meant To, Stories of Who Always Wanted to Write, and Küçük Burun. Let me start with a question to Zeynep Dadak, after which we can go to wherever the conversation takes us. I know we will not be short on topics. Before Ahgözel Istanbul, we had a conversation on a classic Turkish film from 1966, Ahgözel Istanbul by Atif Yilmaz. I think I'm correct in assuming that the title of your film makes a reference to that one, albeit tweaking it considerably. Could you please say a few words on your choice of words here? Hi everyone, and uh, thank you very much for your invitation. And it's it's a great pleasure for me to be here with all of you, and especially with Fatih and uh, Jamal, uh, with whom we have been. I was lucky to have been sharing a, a, a long past, <laughs> we can say, in terms of work and friendship and whatnot. So, um, and I mean, this uh, the answer of this question also ties uh, back to Jamal and our uh, collaboration in Arcus at Istanbul. Um, but I can briefly um, maybe summarize uh, how I try to incorporate my references into the film. Um, basically, uh, we did a thorough research um, of how Istanbul was represented over centuries in different art forms. Uh, and um, of course, uh, film has become a very important part of it, not only in, in Turkish cinema, but also, for example, a film like uh, Le Mortel uh, by Alain Robbrie um, or Maurice Piola's Istanbul films uh, were highly uh, um, influential uh, and inspiring um, for me uh, to make this film. And um, I was of course, I watched Ah Güzel Istanbul many times and I love that film, but at the same time, I am slightly disturbed by its very nostalgic take <laughs> on the city. Uh, so as Jamal and I have been talking about the film, um, that was one of the things we, we kind of knew from the very start that, you know, it, this was not a nostalgic look. This was not a nostalgic gaze. Uh, and, uh, but, um, Instead, it was Kamerjian's um, ways of looking, seeing uh, the city itself uh, actually really gave way to the very um, inception of this film. Uh, so in that sense, Jemai one day said that uh, this is also not only like a beautiful, because Güzel means um, beautiful in Turkish, uh, 
this is not about beauty, but it's also about how you really narrate a city story through different ways of looking at the city. Uh, and that ties to the word göz, which is I. So we made güzel to gözel, uh, making, um, making the word beautiful into, um, into some kind of a, a, a gaze, a, a way of looking at the city, a way of looking, uh, seeing the city. So maybe Gemma can briefly comment on that. Unmute. No, you said it, Zeynep. That's really it. It, it it's a different. Um, at least for the seventeenth century, novel way of writing about the city. We thought, uh, as if Eremia Chelebede camera in his hand. It, it's a pre-cameratic kind of uh, depiction before the invention of, of, of the camera. And that happens to be actually something that people have observed with regard to other parts of the early modern world with new techniques of cartography and new techniques of depiction, uh, not to be teleological about it, anticipate the, the eventual uh, camera gaze. And, and in that sense, uh, Eremia Cerebi was simply one of the most original, one of the most uh, entertaining and one of the most uh, vibrantly visual readings that we wanted to honor. Um. Let's talk a little bit more about Eremia Celebi before um, discussing some genre related questions about the film, because I know that the film can be classified as both a documentary or, you know, um, not a documentary. It's, it's <laughs> sitting somewhere in between a documentary and fiction. I, and I would like to really hear, especially Zeynep's and Fatih's thoughts about, um, you know, the, all the plays with the genres. but. Um, for the moment, let's hear more on Eremia Celebi and his significance and the, the importance of his time, because Eremia Celebi was just one of many Celebis at the time. Um, and this is your term, Jamal Ujam, you know, um, 17th century can be described as the age of Celebis. Um, what would you like to say about that? And what would you like to say about Eremia Celebi uh, specifically? Um, can we, for example, define Celebi as, um, um, you know, flaneur or <laughs> as an outsider of his society at the time? Um, I really would like to hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. Eremia deserves a good deal of attention. But first, on the word documentary, Zeynep and Fatih are the people to speak about it. And I just felt very torn and even apologetic when I used the word on my bio, historical documentary. This film is not a historical documentary, but I just had to give it in so many words and I hope Zeynep forgives me for that. Um, about uh, Eremia Celebi and his time, I mean, this is a, a fascinating moment of various layers of transformations worthy uh, for study and, and reflection. Um, first of all, it's an age when the Armenians, specifically speaking about Armenian communities, established a vast trans-regional commercial and intellectual network. It's a, one of the most impressive uh, inter international or trans-regional networks ever really, both uh, with its uh, commercial, better known aspect, but also with its intellectual aspect. And two of the foremost centers of gravity at that time were Istanbul and Isfahan, both of whom came to be significant centers of Armenian life only circa 1600. It's only an Armenian population before, but nothing like it because of migrations in the late 16th century. And Isfahan is another reason I won't go, it's another story I won't go into, but 
Not surprisingly, the outstanding contributions of the Armenian community of Ottoman Istanbul to the economic and cultural life of their city and beyond started to shine in that 17th century. The Zilijian family's discovery, for instance, of a unique copper alloy to produce musical instruments with an unequaled sonar clarity and resonance is the stuff of legend for any rock or jazz fan. Zilgian is uh, you know, clearly recognizable as, as, as one of the most global uh, musical brands of our time. An artisanal, and by the way, it was in 1623 that they were given the specific charge to produce, uh, produce instruments for the Janissary army. So next year is the 400th anniversary of one of the oldest firms ever. And uh, we hope to celebrate it here. Now, Erem Yakelebi Celebi is not so well known internationally, but he too deserves to be recognized as one of the most intriguing and creative minds of his time among the other intriguing and uh, creative Celebis. Uh, figures like Elem Eremia combined rootedness and cosmopolitanism, localism and universalism, I wrote in a biography, with amazing flair and ingenuity. He was born into a modest family, mostly uh, artisanal, commercial, and clerical. He chose not to have a clerical career himself. Uh, had the patronage of uh, two, two uh, commercial figures, one rather wealthy, Abro Celebi, and another, his maternal uncle, uh, Baker. So he worked in the bakery a good deal. He knew, he knew this life of the city from various angles. Uh, and, uh, and what I want to say is that recently, a, a, an Armenian uh, colleague, student, uh, who's worked on Eremia Chilevi told me that with uh, so far, unidentified materials. He has more than 150 works that constitute his larger oeuvre, and that is very impressive. Of that, I want to highlight just two things. One of them goes into the making of our film, but before that, his diary. His diary, covering the years between 1648 and 1663, clearly marks him as one of the pioneer memoirists of the 17th century an age that witnessed an early explosion of first-person narratives worldwide before the routinization of diary keeping in the modern era. His entertaining yet also deeply moving tale of the Jewish bride is again pioneering in two ways. It is a novella based on a contemporary event that was the gossip of the town among the middle classes with no major political actors or larger than life figures and no allegorical dimension. Something that belongs in the metropolitan news section of modern newspapers. This kind of literature too was emerging as a worldwide trend only then in the hands of authors like our Eremia er, or Saikaku Ihara of Japan, who is well, better known to readers of world literature and of course to students of cinema. Life of an Amorous Woman is his novel that became the basis of Mizoguchi's The Life of Oharu. Now, in the tale of the Jewish bride, which Eremia published in two different languages, first in Greek and then in Turkish, he also, I think, experiments with the genre of a libretto in the age of early opera. The word opera was used first in English in 1644, and Eremia, just a couple of decades after that, was using it in a Turkish text that is his tale of the Jewish bride. And uh, it's just, an, it's just a, one of the very early signs of awareness of uh, the cultural world of Europe and uh, that he also embeds in this experiment, which I consider to be a proto libretto. Anyway, while he prepared his readers for the world of opera before its full blossoming, Eremia took an even bolder step in his history of Istanbul, which is the subject of the film, of course, or at least its source of inspiration. 
His spectacular feat in this masterpiece, I think, was no less than heralding the age of camera two centuries before the instrument was even invented. This grand act of ingenuity presented in a matter of matter of factly manner is highly appropriate to the task of documenting and revealing the quotidian, but also to documenting and depicting a city that was from the 16th century onwards at least, meant to be appreciated as a site. From the 16th century onwards, we have literature which speak of Istanbul as a site to behold, which is not easy to dismiss as a cliche because of the way it is framed. And I don't have the time to develop this point here, but it is an awareness about the layout of the city and the way it presents itself that uh, was forming into a, uh, into a mode of receiving and perceiving Istanbul, the city, uh, comprehensively rather than a specific building or a specific cluster of buildings. And in that sense, Eremia brought a cameratic perspective to it and a Chelebi way of looking at the world in general. Tunch, I already spoke too much, uh, but I wanted to get this out for I, as you can see, I'm full of excitement about Eremia Chelebi and how we ought to keep reading and reinterpreting his stuff along with other Chelebis of his time who were mostly um, again, combining that sense of rootedness and, and, and, and a cosmopolitan awareness of the larger world with its new bodies of learning in geography and cartography. Eremia, by the way, is one of the first to ever do a, a map of, of uh, the Armenian world, of the world of the Armenians. And that is a late 17th century map that is just one of the earliest of its kind. I should shut up. <laughs> and thank you, of course, Tunch. Thank you, Zeynep, Celik Zeynep, uh, for inviting us uh, to, to, to speak about the film that occupied us for so many years and is still on our minds. It will be on our minds too in the years to come. Um, but let me turn to Zeynep and Fatih at this moment. Uh, I mean, yes, Eremia Celebi's history of Istanbul is the main source of inspiration, but uh, there are multiple layers of narration, you know, and sometimes your own voice mixes with Eremia Celebi's voice. I mean, there are voiceovers, there are narrators, there are interview interviewees, um, beating uh, a multi-layered narrative of the film. That makes it a little bit difficult for us who are not well informed of, you know, of cinematographic techniques, where we should situate the film, whether we should view it as a documentary or a creative documentary or a docufiction or, you know, um, would you like to say a few things about um, the genre question or the categories and what you really wanted to achieve by mixing different layers of narration? Um, I can briefly talk about what I had in mind, and then maybe um, Fatih can, uh, because we already had a kind of a really nice conversation about the film in Ankara uh, this past June uh, in a film festival. And um, also Fatih and Jamal's relationship date back and uh, Fatih is uh, kind of partly responsible of Jamal's cinematic end wars. So maybe we can just combine it uh, with that. Um, basically, I can again refer to what Jamal has just uh, said about the Zijian family, actually. That's in a way summarizes my strategy of uh, how I wanted to adapt this particular text. Um, there is a, there is a, like, it, the, the book itself, um, I mean, I highly recommend if you have not uh, read it to also to our viewers uh, to read it. It's a very, um, I think like, it's that's an easy read. <laughs> um, and um, 
it it is it works as an inventory it works as a as a compilation of anecdotes um it's very interesting also it's a kind of like a like a city guidebook in today's terms and um so when we were talking about the book uh certain kind of i was trying to read between the lines actually for example he talks about someone who is making uh, making sounds around um around i think uh it was uh the city walls yes city walls and uh Jumen and i have discussed uh if that particular place could be where the Jian family first started to you know uh, produce their uh, zivs, uh, so their musical um, instruments. In that sense, um, I was really like trying to read uh, with the book and kind of imagine um, imagine what those places would become. Uh, like after Kemurjan um, passed away, and if he would come to today's Istanbul, and if he would visit these particular places, like what kind of stories would I like to tell him? So it's like it was kind of like a conversation that I had, of course, like with Jamal's incredible, generous guidance uh, I had with him. In that sense, uh, those sounds, the soundscape of the film, really refers. Uh, to um, you know today's Istanbul, but at the same time, things that I have imagined, like in the in the example I have given about the Zijia family, you know, all these like little fantasies that he triggered uh, in my imagination. Uh, so in that sense, I didn't necessarily want the audience to focus on the story and like follow everything bit by bit, but really like uh, the film itself is a flow. Uh, so I would, I would answer your question, uh, Tunch, as like, let it flow. <laughs> like, you know, you don't, we don't have to really categorize what kind of a film um, the film is, but really if we just like, if the viewer can uh, let it flow and just like really imagine that she is on a boat um, rolling down the, you know, stream, uh, the Bosporus, um, I think that would really like uh, satisfy my <laughs> uh, my reasons to make uh, make this uh, make this documentary. <laughs> and uh, I mean, um, before I, I I give it to uh, Fatih, I can also add that the film I never imagined the film only as a as a as a film about visual pleasure, <laughs> uh, but really about uh, how you know we can really communicate with other artists or intellectuals from from different um, times in history, uh, and also uh, I was like mesmerized by the way by the ways in which uh, Kemurjian was describing Istanbul as a water city, like how it was necessary necessarily like in a way. Um, uh, de de described uh, through the waters around it, uh, including Bosporus, uh, the Black Sea, Marmara Sea, and uh, the rivers uh, inside. Uh, so in that sense, my, um, my two cinemat cinematic strategies were uh, create a, a visual lens that I could really, in a way, try to reenact his ways of looking, but at the same time, um, the flowing like um, frame uh, was as important as the, the, the initial one. Uh, so basically it's kind of like a film uh, set in waters uh, and uh, it really tries to describe a certain type of uh, visual pleasure. Um, Fatih Bey? Um, uh, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> you well, know, uh, where, do, where do you situate the film in terms of, yes. um, you know, uh, documentary tradition or genre-related genre issues? Yeah. 
uh, uh, actually the curious thing about strolling alongside uh, Kemurjian uh, through Istanbul uh, is that it resembles very much uh, walking around Istanbul with <laughs> Jamal Celebi, uh, <laughs> which is almost <laughs> as exciting uh, to do. I don't remember if you've ever been on a boat, probably we haven't, uh, but he's a great walker, so am I. And it's a kind of um, uh, Kümürcüyan kind of, not moment, but hours of going around and at the same time talking uh, about this and that, uh, visiting galleries, um, publishing houses, uh, we both know, or uh, he takes us and takes me to a place. He goes to a gallery, likes a painting, maybe buys a small sketch, this and that. So, uh, actually, the film is, or uh, the way he conceives uh, of Kemurjian is more or less in this spirit. And that's what I always cherish most, uh, not only in this film, but um, uh, going around with uh, Jamal as well. Uh, how I made his acquaintance is a, a story beginning uh, with the 2000s, he invited me and a colleague of, uh, of uh, mine, uh, Gugokce, to a conference, Turkish cinema conference again, in Harvard. Of course, I heard of him and read the Asiya Hatun uh, book. Uh, but there, when uh, I was in uh, Harvard uh, for the lecture, I had the luck, fortune, to lay my hands on the photocopies of his other essays, uh, which were really very exciting because uh, they were something I have always liked to read. Uh, it was a um, way of looking at history between history writing and storytelling, which is amazing. And uh, it's not popular history, it's not uh, academic writing uh, per se, but uh, it is a way of looking at um, this and that through the eyes of the characters, protagonists, which is remarkable. And uh, uh, that's what makes his writing uh, I'm not going to similar, uh, I'm not going to say similar to Kemurcia, but uh, certainly in that vein. Uh, this kind of writing is very rare in Turkish, um, uh, in the classical uh, Turkish way of looking at history, uh, to imagine history uh, using uh, the few scraps you get uh, hold of and uh, to make uh, to turn them into a kind of story um, based on a certain uh, kind of truth. Uh, what comes to my mind is um, uh, writing a piece by Ahmed Hamdi Tampanar, which who I admire for many reasons, for many other reasons. Uh, it's something, a piece called uh, Bajazet, uh, Sheikh Baza, Bajazet, uh, in that piece, um, uh, Tampanar imagines uh, that an Ottoman clerk goes to watch a performance of Racine's uh, Bajazet in the French embassy. And he compares uh, uh, the facts about kings and queens and emperors and this and that with his own society, which is remarkable. Uh, Tampanar imagines a character which could have been present at the performance in the French embassy. Uh, the performance itself is a fact, apparently, but how he uh, goes around the subject and imagines what the clerk might have thought when he was performing, uh, when he was watching the performance, is really remarkable. It's a one-of-a-kind thing. 
uh, that kind of spirit uh, is always present in uh, uh, Jamai's writing too. And uh, uh, so together we have compiled four of his uh, essays or pieces, let's say, uh, uh, to form uh, the book called Kim uh, Varimish Bizorada Yowikan. And the remarkable thing, uh, as the title says as well, is uh, Jamal's curiosity uh, about uh, who was there when we were not there, as the title would translate. That is a kind of um, uh, curiosity based on uh, on a curiosity of the lives of others, not only contemporary, but also uh, ages away, let's say. And uh, because he's very much interested in the quotidian, as he himself uh, uh, said uh, about Kumurjian, uh, these essays are in, always informed uh, with that uh, curiosity about people, places, and uh, little scraps of things, how, uh, what kind of belongings would be uh, in, a, in the bag of an Ottoman mer merchant or uh, something like that. Uh, so the title was apt, really, because this curiosity uh, informs his kind of writing, his kind of walking, his kind of visiting different places, and also his kind of interest in cinema. Uh, in 2009, uh, the then directors of the Istanbul Film Festival, Aziz Kaya, uh, Aziz Tan, uh, wanted him to uh, prepare a program for the Istanbul Film Festival, and uh, that program, as um, uh, you have mentioned, I think, or Zeynep Hanım mentioned was called Rebels, Troubadours, and Saints, uh, uh, reflecting different aspects of uh, rebeldom or troubadourhood or um, sainthood uh, in uh, different films, uh, but largely based on uh, the stories uh, of the characters the, themselves. Uh, I remember, uh, he chose <coughs> films not only for the historical, the, the significance and or the importance of the historical events themselves, but uh, for the uh, very role uh, uh, the characters played uh, in these um, uh, events, let's say. Uh, sometimes it could be like an uprising like uh, Michael Kohlhaas. I don't know, we have shown whether we have shown film this film, we wanted to. Jamal yeah, we couldn't. Very, For, Volker could, Schlendorf end, doesn't. Could, but he was very much interested in Volker Schlendorf's uh, my, Michael Kohlhaas uh, for the very reason of the role of the individual. Uh, and and uh, he was also interested, as I think he mentioned, the life of Oharu, uh, the Japanese uh, concubine story, for the same reason, uh, how uh, the character's uh, fate, as we would say, played a part in the uh, in the of, of, of whole uh, uh, palace complex uh, structure of the uh, Japanese society of that time. He was also very much interested in uh, uh, more contemporary stuff, uh, uh, and uh, we have also chosen some. Uh, more uh, contemporary films, also Turkish films, uh, somewhat neglected until that point. Was it Karajovalan's, uh, uh, Karajovalan and uh, Karajovalan? Kızılırma Karakoyun. Kızılırma Karakoyun was one of them. And uh, uh, a film about Karajovalan was the other. Uh, yes. and, the, and the title uh, of the book comes uh, from a poem of Karajovalan. Uh, uh, anyway, wouldn't you? Am I, I'm yes, not, yes, uh, yes, yes. Kim varmış biz burada yokken. 
uh, I must confess that I was not very happy with the title at first hearing. I found it uh, very sort of folkloric and this and that, uh, uh, prejudice of the um, uh, middle-class intellectuals, I'm going to say. <laughs> uh, but then I discovered that it's more than apt because uh, it, it really is about that with uh, uh, Gemma's understanding of history and stories in general, stories uh, of people and the histories they have uh, set in. Um, really, who was here when we were uh, not here and what did they do? So uh, the film itself reflects this uh, interest really very much and it was like, uh, largely on a boat, wasn't it? On, on waterways, uh, with uh, Kumurjian uh, standing in for for standing in for uh, Jamal Kapatar or vice versa. Uh, what I found about the film most interesting that it's bathed in a light, which is uh, more probably the work of Florent uh, Henry, the, uh, the French. Cine cinematographer, Istanbul is not that shiny and that glamorous, that bathed in light. Uh, but when, uh, uh, uh, in my experience at least, uh, that, that, that doesn't hurt. And when you, especially looking from the seaside through different doors and gates, places we have not really visited for a long time or ever. Uh, uh, you get a glimpse of the city that is jubilant, sunny, alive, and very much of today, which is uh, a, a, a considerable success of uh, the film. I don't know about the genre and I don't care. The film uh, itself <laughs> is very successful in that uh, uh, respect. Uh, as was Zeynep's uh, film before that, uh, on the coast of, uh, the, the, what year was it? 2010, 11. 2010, because Zeynep was the ideal person to, uh, to collaborate on this subject, the commercial, probably, but because uh, in that film too, on that coast, she uh, looks at the city or the seaside city or uh, sea resort, seaside resort, uh, was it or the city itself? Anyway, no, it was, was a seaside. It was a small was town, a seaside like resort, a yeah. seaside a sea town called Erikli in Saroskoy. Yes, she was looking at that particular um, uh, scenery, let's say, uh, from the sea and. Uh, uh, uh, depending on its relationship uh, with the sea. That's important, I find, because on the coast is about the life, uh, uh, the daily life, the quotidian life of a coast. And uh, uh, the coast informs the land, uh, the, the sea and vice versa and this and that. People live according to the coming and going of the sea, uh, according to what people do on uh, seaside resorts normally, uh, or uh, what they do, uh, things they can do, things we cannot begin to imagine, like the transvestite in a cafe singing and uh, dancing for the uh, public, uh, which I found really interesting. And uh, so uh, it's, I think, a very um, good collaboration between uh, a person who has this interest in the uh, um, uh, stories uh, that uh, feed history, if you like, in large letters, and uh, a cinema a director who can look at a city uh, or at land from the seaside. Uh, that makes the film uh, quite interesting in my uh, opinion. 
by the way, let me briefly um, mention that uh, the, the On the Coast is available um, on YouTube and Vimeo uh, on internet. Uh, and also, um, I had a, a wonderful collaborator uh, in that film, Marve Kayan. I would also yeah, like it's, to. It's a, it's a co directed film with Marve Kayan, uh, as was The Blue Wave, I think. Yes. Uh, it's a remarkable piece of filmmaking. I don't know how to classify it. And uh, I don't know if it's necessary to classify such an uh, effort. Uh, uh, that's it. Uh, let, me add a let me add a reminder before it's too late to especially our participants. I mean, if you have questions to our panelists, please use the Q&A box um, and you, know, you can write down your questions um, and we will address at least some of them. Okay. Um, sorry, Zeynep Hocam, go ahead. It's fine. I was, follow I was going to follow up on Farki Bey's comments. Um, watching the film, I came across a duality uh, that I very much know from other authors, but I do not know. I only know the modern period. I do not know the pre-modern period so well. It is this view of the city from the outside, from the sea, versus what happens in the inside. And I think you did a very intriguing job by taking us inside the city through those gates. I'm wondering if you want to elaborate a little bit more on this duality. It is really another city from the outside. It may not yeah. be as glorious yeah. as the travelers describe it, but it is. And yeah. you seem to punctuate that. It's a, it's a city for my part, I haven't seen from the sea. Uh, I, I mean, uh, some parts, at, uh, uh, especially the beginning. Uh, I, I've never... I never went through the, that gate or uh, whatever it is. And uh, um, yeah, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a city, as we always say, informed by the sea very much with its, uh, by its relationship with the sea. Uh, but uh, that the film takes us through uh, the gates into the city and sometimes flies over the waterways like in the Göksu. Uh, part, wasn't it, uh, is, uh, I think, a remarkable feat, which reminds us that uh, Istanbul is a city surrounded by the sea, and uh, it's not just a cliche, it's a fact. That's uh, what is uh, remarkable about that uh, aspect of the film, I find, uh, if I have understood your uh, question correctly, or if you want, if you can elaborate, I would like to further answer. I would, I would like Zeynep Dadak to talk about it a little bit, because she very deliberately stuck to the exterior uh, image of the city and then took us inside. In fact, it, I found it very striking that from the Byzantine walls, we go into the bustling contemporary streets and it's a very abrupt transition there. Is it? I thought I it was so. very slow. No, no, I did not. I'm not using abrupt in a negative sense, but I'm saying it was a surprise. Yeah, the one we see the cars. Yes. The, yeah. yes. So I'm wondering if uh, Zeynep would like to speak to that a little bit more, the two images. And we read this over and over and over. In fact, travelers who come to Istanbul, they see it from outside and all go a bit so wonderful. And then when we walk into the neighborhoods, what a mess. I'm not saying this is what the movie is doing, but I think the duality is being uh, powerfully conveyed in this movie. Mm -hmm. At least the way I saw it, but I may be wrong. No, no, I like that. It's very true, actually. It's also about like how Kemurjan narrated um, his uh, account. Um, that's also something Jamal and I have been talked about a lot. 
when Jema said as as as uh, if he has a camera at hand that included camera moments actually because he says that he always stays on the boat but then he starts describing this really intricate like stories about like a particular person or a location and if he's on a boat it's kind of impossible for him to see through um, and uh, it, it, I mean, he's really like, even in his own narration, he is already a ghost. He's like, he's acting as if he, he can just like fly over and then, you know, um, fly through the city or he can just take his out, eyes out and kind of, you know, almost like a, uh, like a drone um, uh, movement. So it's like, I was like, when I started to read, uh, the book, uh, like in terms of how I would incorporate a certain cameratic uh, strategy uh, before uh, I introduced it to Florian Heri, uh, and he was also a great, great uh, collaborator as Fatih uh, mentioned, um, my cinematographer. And uh, I, I just realized that he really describes, like Kemurjian describes certain moments that I can definitely like easily fit into certain um, like lens movements or like uh, camera movements, like a uh, you know dolly shot, a crane shot, or a or a drone shot. So I was constantly trying to understand how far um, he imagines himself uh, from the boat. The, that was my strategy in terms of uh, kind of um, going in, into going inside the city from these gates. Uh, so his his uh, he, he he was the one who gave me the directions and also like for example what Fatih has uh, mentioned about the light also um, Jamal had um, brought that to my attention a few times that he had a particular uh, light code in the book again like for example when he describes people are going to work in the morning towards Eminönü, he, he doesn't even say, say uh, the location, but he describes the light. He says the sun is coming um, mm. uh, like on them. And uh, then you imagine like, so that must be, he must, they must be going towards Eminönü. So even if you don't really read the names of, the, uh, of that particular neighborhood, if you follow the, the light cues in the, uh, in the book, uh, you can really uh, orient yourself and you can really understand where you're at um, in the city, which I find fascinating. Uh, it's like not only about uh, like having a camera at hand, but it's like we have a full cinematographer in a boat, uh, like Cameron Gian himself. I really would like to you know, elaborate on the entire experience of viewing and filming the city by the sea. I mean, are there particular moments or particular views of neighborhoods that surprised you when you were shooting the film by the sea? Mm. The opening scene, for instance, I mean, I was particularly mesmerized by, you know, um, the entrance to the Samatya um, gate and you know viewing the hospital behind um, and the only surviving sea um, you know fortress etc uh, etc cetera, et cetera. I wonder whether you had those kind of uh, personal moments of amazement or surprise the when pace of it, the, yeah. the pace of the entrance the, slow, mm -hmm. the, the luxurious deliberate uh, rhythm that was remarkable yes um i like we spent a lot of time on on the boat of course on several boats actually five at total i think because we we needed different uh speeds we dif we needed different um kind of for example with like one boat the big boat <laughs> jim and i were on it was like we, we couldn't go very close to the shore so it's like we had to pick a smaller boat in order to go closer. So it's like we had to make certain uh, changes. Uh, I cannot necessarily think of a particular moment at sea that surprised me, but I definitely was surprised by the Ethiopian presence in the Armenian church. 
that was a moment that was really unexpected because we were already in contact with the with the church we had our permits and everything and we were supposed to we, they knew that we were supposed to shoot that day and we went and they said you know in the small chapel we had this um this group and they don't have their own uh, church so um you know they they use our small chapel and then like when i went inside i saw uh, that they were having their mass and like we uh we asked for permission to shoot and they said yes and then I just realized that it was uh, already a Byzantine church because I saw the ayazma uh, as described in the film. There was like water under the uh, a water cave under the uh, this church. So it means that the Armenian church already belonged to a Greek community before it was um, transferred uh, to to the Armenian Armenian patriarch. So it was like all these things that I read about and thought about just, you know, became a reality as I walked into this, uh, in, into this church on this particular Sunday. And I mean, although I really like, uh, it's a heavily scripted film, like that moment, for example, was completely spontaneous and, uh, and Florian was amazing in that sense. Whenever I, we caught something, it was, we were really, really like running after it. So I think for this type of film, it was important to have that moment of, you know, very stable, uh, a very uh, stable understanding of how uh, you will shoot that uh, location. But at the same time, if you run into something, uh, run into an ex unexpected, uh, you know, guest, uh, as in that case, you should be open to accommodate that in the film. So that was a very interesting and very, I don't know, almost like a magical moment for me. And even the way that scene is shot, like that backlit, you know, like almost like a holy light coming from uh, outside. I don't know, it was like a very, uh, uh, yeah, very uh, rich uh, moment for me. And the it was a very striking, it was a very striking moment for me too in the movie, but I also loved it because it, brought me to a reality about Istanbul, which I was not ready to see in this film. Who yeah. lives there? Who lives in this neighborhood? Yeah. What yeah. kind of a population are we talking mm. about right now? And I thought that was very well done. And I'm so happy that um, Trump helped you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and the I, at the very, I'm, I'm sorry, Jamal uh, Jam. The, the script Please. has had very moment uh, perfectly overlapped, I believe, with the scene, just because Eremia was talking at the moment about Gurbet, yeah. uh, the idea of longing for one's homeland and the immigrants. And er Eremia Celebi can also be defined as an immigrant because his family right. uh, came all the way to Western Anatolia after the Büyük Kaçkun of the late 16th century. Um, so maybe this, I mean, this is not a question or um, to Jamal Ojan, but would you like to say a few things about that? Sure, sure, sure. I think his parents' generation uh, were, and he was very, very well aware of it. And he uses the word Gurbet Zedeh and Teseligyah for that church. He says, and, and he uses them in Turkish. Mm -hmm. uh, this church, he says, is Teseligyah for the Gurbet Zedeh, namely a place of consolation for people afflicted with exile and or self-exile or exile immigration. Uh, you know, the, the word Gurbet could have any connotations, but we know what it means when it is at that time, particular time of his parents and grandparents who had to move because of because of uh, unrest in the countryside and Ottoman Persian wars, which wreaked havoc in uh, his grandparents' homeland in Ain area in the late 16th century. So that, I, th I wasn't there on that day, but uh, seeing that scene was, because I knew that he'd used those words and those are very powerful words in my opinion, both of them. Uh, and he, because he felt the power of those words, he used them in Turkish. In the middle of an Armenian narrative, he chooses which words to 
which was to introduce into, into his otherwise Armenian text. And uh, I saw that on the screen after Zeynep had mentioned it to me, and I was wowed. The music also. Uh, I mean, in general, the sounds, I think, is, I mean, I was so blessed to be able to work with Zeynep on this because she really, it's not just about reading the text and understanding it, but she has a feel for the city, which I'm sure anybody who watches the film will be able to agree with. And, and also with the sounds. And I thought the film was finished and she told me she had to do some sound and color editing. I thought, come on. <laughs> and it took, it took a long time. And now, then I figured out why. It, the sound editing in the end, the awareness of the different sounds of the city to the degree one can bring them into the film. And of course, the music that was, that was uh, made for the film, some of it was, I thought worked very, very well together. There was a question from the audience, which I wanted to answer briefly, which is a very good question by Emre Kazulkaya about that I described Eremia Cherubi's cameratic observations and he writes, we know that there are various ways of looking and seeing, the tourist gaze, the native gaze, the imperial gaze, etc. Excellent uh, observation and a good question that follows. I think it's very much the native gaze uh, that, that makes the work all the more remarkable, as I said, because it's to look at Istanbul as a site is uh, celebrated worldwide as a uh, foreigners, as an outsiders, and that's not to be belittled either, uh, as a tourist's eventually gaze, let's say. This is not it, <laughs> either Latifi verbally in the 16th century or Eremia Celebi cameratically verbally in the 17th century or Evliya, but I don't have time to end that. They do have very much of a different gaze than that card post, card postal, po postcard gaze, which is now iconic. Uh, for instance, the light bit that uh, Zeynep mentioned, to give a bit more detail on it, he says that, and he's speaking of Samatya, his, his home neighborhood, which was uh, where that also church, of course, is located. So he writes that, those of us who work for a living walk towards the sun in the morning and in the evening. This is so brilliant. He's, he's walking toward Eminönü, toward the east in the morning and back towards Samatya in the evening. And it's, you know, it's, it, it's the light that gives him his coordinates in that narrative, which is also written for a native gaze, because who would understand it otherwise? Yeah. But I would like to add that um, those gazes uh, get mixed up sometimes. Uh, the individualized gate and the postcard gate is in cities or in Istanbul, uh, at least. I mean, sometimes you see a sunset and uh, it's, it's a brilliant sunset and you uh, you think, Maybe I should make a picture of this with your camera or something. Then you say, no, that would be too cliched when it comes, when it's printed or something. Uh, the gaze is not only a matter of looking, probably, a matter of feeling too, a matter of that, uh, a matter of air, uh, um, the noises around you, this and that. Uh, so uh, the gaze is not. Um, um, innocent or uh, uh, totally uh, uh, on its own, uh, relevant on its own. Uh, so th those cases get mixed up easily and then make you uh, think whether you're a tourist uh, in your own city, uh, although you've seen this, uh, that sunset for a uh, hundred times. Uh, it's, a, it's a matter of mood and atmosphere too. Uh, I find, and uh, when you film it or when you take a picture of it, suddenly it becomes a cliche. It may become a cliche. Mm -hmm. It depends on uh, uh, not only the light, but also on a long uh, tradition of looking at the same site uh, through different uh, gazes, 
uh, professional gazes, more uh, uh, mood-based uh, gazes, descriptions of them. Let's not forget, uh, for example, uh, um, about Lotti's descriptions uh, of Istanbul. They are remarkable. They are like uh, uh, um, photographs taken of different sites, Çamlıca Tepesi and this and that. Uh, Narvives as well, uh, of different uh, troubadour cafes, etc. They are remarkable. And uh, the gaze, it's is not only uh, informed by the um, visual thing, but also uh, by the mood, by the cultural uh, um, heritage of the one who looks at that uh, particular uh, scene. Uh, so that I would like to say that the gaze is not... Um, easily uh, classifiable, this case, that case. We find uh, uh, ourselves being a stumbleoid sometimes that uh, we are in a postcard. And mm -hmm. uh, we say, damn, this is like a cosplay game. And this is a, a remarkable thing about looking uh, at the city and experience, experiencing looking uh, at the city, I find. Um, can I ask something about um, whether we can add a nostalgic gaze as well to these number of gazes? I know you, it, in your initial remarks, Zeynep said that Ah Güzel Istanbul of Art of Yilmaz was extremely nostalgic in its way of I said slightly, Tunj. Oh, slightly. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about <laughs> it. Not, um, I disagree. Yeah, ah Güzel Istanbul, the original Art of Yilmaz film, is very humorous when yes. looking at Istanbul. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, it looks, uh, it looks uh, at an Istanbul in rooms almost, and it makes fun of nostalgia at the same time. Yeah. And uh, uh, uh, it's a black and white film, uh, which doesn't, of course, greatly matter, but uh, it makes uh, huge fun of a certain idea of nostalgic Istanbul, uh, which is very much fashionable today. Uh, as opposed to the to the time when Ah Güzel Istanbul was made. Uh, yes. So my question is, is there any room in your film uh, for nostalgia? I mean, I recall certain scenes like references to Aragular, where he says that I'm photographing Istanbul just because everything will disappear otherwise. I need to yes. just preserve um, whatever left uh, beautiful about the city or um, some script about graveyards. I mean, graveyards are the only places where we can remember that uh, people from different confessional uh, backgrounds were living together in the city. Um, what would you like to say about nostalgia uh, in, your, in your movie? Uh, I can, of course, talk about it quite extensively, but uh, I don't think we're really kind of uh, exempt from uh, from uh, that nostalgic look. Uh, as Fatih has just like mentioned, I totally agree that, you know, how do we really draw the line um, between what our gaze can also turn into? So, but at least like, if you have this question in mind when you're filming it, I think that helps. Then you can, uh, like, I'm not talking about like kind of stereotyping it, of course, but really like trying to uh, also like look at your own image, the image you have just made uh, as an outsider sometimes. Uh, I think for me that I, I always try to include that strategy. Um, and I think it is okay to, to you know, uh, bring that, um uh, emotional aspect uh also that that feeling of longing a certain type of past in the film but to me the most important thing is that it's like there is not a single moment of you know like the golden um you know city where everything is was bright and you know great so many people from different religious uh lived 
together. It was a cosmopolitan dream. It was not, you know, it's like, uh, and in that sense, what I tried to uh, at least like call attention to was, um, I mean, yes, uh, certain things are like really demolished horribly, uh, I don't know, like treated in the last maybe 40, 50 years, uh, and especially in the last 20 years. But at the same time, uh, certain ways of, um, in a way, not respecting the city and its uh, people were always um, among the among the the, the you know uh, dominant strategies of the rulers of the city, uh, including what happened in in uh, in the sixth and seventh uh, of uh, September when we lost. Uh, all the information about the grave, the Armenian and Greek, Greek graveyards, for example. So it's like, it's not about, you know, like we all live together, what happened to us now? Like, I just like shied away from that kind of attitude. But of course, like we are, I mean, that this film is, a, is my own uh, strategy to exist in Istanbul and to keep loving it and kind of, as Fatih has said, you know, like as my gaze also changes and, um, you know, my ways of dealing with the city changes. So uh, it is also very personal in that sense. And uh, I mean, I didn't, I didn't, I can never say that my, my, my look uh, didn't have that kind of nostalgia. Of course it did, but at the same time, I tried to be as critical as possible uh, about it. At least like a sense of it that, that would make people uh, remember after. Uh, yes, I, I find nostalgia is a dirty word. When it comes to a city <laughs> uh, which changes so abruptly, so drastically, uh, and so often, uh, which makes it uh, remarkable, uh, as well. Uh, uh, nostalgia in, in a form today in Istanbul, in Turkey, uh, is uh, very much open to um, consumption and uh, in, the, in, the, in the wrong sense. Uh, so, I mean, the attraction of the film is not at all uh, a, nos a feeling of nostalgia. Uh, uh, for the city, uh, which Kömürcüyan didn't feel at all, I think. And uh, following Kömürcüyan, the makers of this film uh, uh, uh, adopt the same attitude too, I find, uh, personally. Which is brilliant and vibrant. Thank you. But Kömürcüyan was also like, it, he, he was not, um, yeah, I mean, Jamal maybe can... Uh, talk much better about the final, like the closing remarks of Gömürcüyan, which I find fascinating. But before that, there is a question that I'd like to address, maybe because I think it's um, something I can answer. <laughs> uh, Dalia Kandiotis question. Thank you. I think it's a very, uh, very good and very important question. Uh, the, the narration. Uh, so basically, I try to actually we shot uh, much more than what you see in the film. Uh, we had shot of like in I think over hundred locations. So what I tried to do during the research, I photographed every location, and then I tried to come up with a certain um, certain keyword. Sometimes a story sometimes a personality, sometimes a keyword, like uh, Jamal has just mentioned this whole like Gurbet, uh, for example, notion uh, when it comes to his own uh, neighborhood, uh, Samatya, uh, Kumkapa. Uh, so in that sense, I, uh, because I already had what I want to deal with uh, in mind in this particular section, chapter, location, whatever it is, uh, I, made a list of people who I would like to talk about these notions in today's Istanbul, alive. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, <laughs> uh, so uh, in that sense, that was my more or less the commentators, actors. Uh, I, I just uh, tried to reach uh, people that I really like, would like to have a conversation about that particular 
notion or location. And um, in terms of my own writing, uh, what I tried to do was like, because I uh, had Kemurjan's um, like voice in my head, instead of using the book, um, like kind of uh, word by word, uh, I, I, in a way, you know, re, um, like wrote certain things. Uh, so it's uh, sometimes it's his own words, but mostly it's also like my take on what he, uh, what he wants, what he talks about in that uh, chapter. So um, in that sense, I decided to include my own, in a way, commentary uh, into his uh, writing as he talks about the city. I, I, I mean, and because I had Jemai <laughs> to ask for consent about this, because the historians, I don't know, Tunju uh, Zeynep what you would think about that uh, if I have committed a crime uh, by doing that. But I, I, I really, um, I try to uh, talk with him as I, as I wrote. So uh, even as it is as if he is speaking. It is not only his words, but also my words uh, were merged uh, into his. That was my uh, my strategy. And in the towards the end, it becomes clear, of course. Like the the final episode is my words completely, but again, uh, it's based on particular emotions that he described. So, so it's not like I am all of a sudden taking over. Many of you said you have many more shots that you didn't use for this film. Do you have any plans to use them at all at some <laughs> other time? Yeah, I've been I've been thinking and talking about this for a while, so I hope you know uh, I hope I can really do it. Uh, I want to you know like extend the film into a, maybe like a multimedia project, like mapping. Also, I don't know, like using some of the videos and footage that I have shot. So not a film, but maybe uh, something like that I can do in a gallery or some kind of an essayistic, I don't know, um, format, long format that I can collaborate with other uh, people. I, I've been thinking about it. Uh, I don't think I will make another film uh, from that footage. Uh, Argus Istanbul 2, <laughs> uh, the blockbuster. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I would really like to think and use those uh, material. Also including the research material, like there are a really lot of stuff just sitting there <laughs> right now. Maybe a book. <laughs> Some digital humanities scholars working on Istanbul or early modern Istanbul would definitely be interested in collaborating with you yeah. for that kind of project. That would be fantastic, yeah. yeah. I hope one day. <laughs> There is a question, um, to, again, to you, Zeynep, uh, from Gül Özyen, um regarding the significance of gender uh, as to our discussion on um, the question of gays. Yes. Um, of course, it's, it's, it was one of the central um, questions and concerns I had. Uh, and that's why I, I really also imagined Kemurjian sometimes as a young girl, sometimes as a, you know, um, like a far off relative, like an old uncle or whatnot. Uh, I tried to really um, imagine him out of his body in a way, like, a, and, uh, but at the same time, of course, like coming back to today's Istanbul has a certain type of reality that as a woman on the street, when you walk, you still receive this kind of unavoidable, annoying gaze. And like, how do we really translate that into film? Like, these are all, of course, big questions I had in mind. Uh, but at the same time, that's why I, I, I really wanted to include this Asiya Hatun section uh, at, the, at the end. Uh, I mean, I was all, always like in love with, with uh, Fatih, uh, but the, the book Fatih had edited Jemai's book uh, and Asiya Atun was already in that book. And 
and Jema was uh, generous enough to talk about that particular uh, piece uh, with Suna Kafadar. Uh, Suna is also a very, of course, a very, very important collaborator in the film. And she, she started talking about like how important this type of first person narrative um, was important in terms of the, uh, also within the, um, you know, uh, literal tradition and um, literary, sorry, <laughs> literary tradition. And um, so I think by transitioning into that narrative and also through the narration by changing the, the narrator, uh, I thought, you know, it, it, it is an again, another question. If this whole movie that we have just seen uh, could have been like narrated by a woman walking the city. Uh, so like a blonde woman. <laughs> uh, so it was uh, something that I tried to play, but not necessarily. I mean, there were so many things <laughs> that I, uh, I I just like was trying to make sure that I don't really, um, you know, uh, preach uh, about certain uh, ways of, you know, looking so that was my way of transition like a smooth transition to thinking of the the female gaze i have a question for I very both, much uh, appreciated this not preaching poem in the movie uh it's really very humble in a way it is done uh, and, and it's remarkable that way yeah but I, i'm also curious about the reception I do not know much. I know it hit bad times. Uh, yeah. <laughs> did you get the kind of reception you were expecting or do you see a future for the film? Um, and what, what kind of audience? For the sequel? <laughs> no, no, no, no, no. The, the movie that we watched. Yes, I know. What kind of audience were you thinking of and did you get this audience? I did, interestingly, yeah, like more than I have imagined, actually, like it was a very turbulent period when we released the film. It was just like we finished the film and like uh, the lock, the first lockdown came and then we were lucky to still uh, like open it in a, in, a, in a big documentary festival. And then like the Turkey, uh, Antalya and Istanbul Film Festival screenings were uh, also physical screenings. So we got lucky in that sense to see an actual uh, audience. Uh, and, but then of course, like cinemas just, it gets more and more difficult. And uh, without that made us uh, move uh, a little bit uh, faster. Um, in terms of the digital distribution and without uh, unfortunately planning a theatrical distribution, we've decided to uh, go online. And uh, we, we, uh, we were online at MUBI, Turkey last year uh, in March. And, uh, and that was the second lockdown. And that was really very unexpected. People were at home. And uh, we were getting these like uh, messages from people, also getting feedback from Mubi that it was watched. It all of a sudden has become like the second mostly watched film. And it was really, because people really couldn't go out to Istanbul, they stayed at home and <laughs> watched the film. It was an interesting uh, coincidence. Um, and then also uh, we were able to translate the, the film to West uh, Armenian, to Eastern Armenian uh, languages. Uh, so in that sense, within the Armenian community, we were able to reach out to different uh, types of communities, especially diaspora, uh, diaspora communities. And also in Turkey, we had like uh, great collaborators like Arasya Yinjuluk, Ranting Foundation. So it was, in that sense, we were able to reach out to uh, the communities we have anticipated. And um, also we, trans we were uh, screened in France, Germany, we, we, had, we translated the film, uh, but the, the reception in Turkey was really beyond what we have uh, expected. Um, and this is really, I don't like saying this, but probably if we had a theatrical release first, we would have never reached so many people. 
So it's like really, it's another discussion, but we have to find a middle ground between the digital distribution and the theatrical distribution. Or a connection, not a middle ground. But. Can I ask something really quick about the Western Armenian and Eastern Armenian trans subtitles of the film that you're uh, getting prepared? Uh, are you going to use um, Eremia Celebi's original text or would the subtitles in Western Armenian and Eastern Armenian be made based on the Turkish translation made by Andreasian? No, I mean, uh, they, we were, we, we, uh, I, we also referred to the original uh, text, like both translators were also historians. So they had, they were quite knowledgeable about like the original text. And also the institutions that supported us financially for the translation gave it extensive uh, feedback. So the translation was a thing itself. <laughs> yeah, luckily. We cannot thank you enough for this very, very engaging conversation and uh, for the intelligent movie, for all your contribution. And thank you very much for accepting our invitation. We will repeat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, nothing to add other than expressing how grateful we are for um, hosting you. I hope we can uh, have another session in another time in person this time. We very much look forward to hosting you here in New York uh, another, for another occasion, maybe. Um, well, thank you so much uh, for your time and wonderful comments and this um, vibrant conversation. Thank you. Thank you.